The Panasonic Lumix S5 was released in September of 2020 and was instantly a hit for many people. Many independent reviewers raved about its value for money, although it did have some flaws, which will be covered in this video. Earlier this year in 2023, Lumix released the Mark II, which improved on the Mark I in almost every single way. Does that mean then the Lumix S5 is an outdated piece of gear from yesterday's market? Or might it actually be even more of a bargain now? Let me show you what I mean. Now, I just want to start by saying at the beginning of this video that I have no affiliation with Lumix whatsoever. I've never had contact with them. They've never sent me a camera. This is purely my own review from a camera that I bought myself. I spent my own money on it so I can be as honest as I want. Although Lumix, if you are watching, then... Uh, get in touch. As a bit of a background as to who I am, uh, I'm a photographer and videography sort of came later in my life as I wanted to share my work a bit more. I wanted to invest in sharing that via video. So I wanted a really good hybrid camera because I didn't want to own a camera that wasn't capable of doing good photos as well. Photography is really important to me and if I was going to get a video camera then I wanted a true hybrid one. And as somebody that had very little experience in videography when I first started, uh, I was completely reliant on other reviewers. I couldn't really make my own mind up. So I did lots of research and came to the Lumix S5 as my conclusion. I initially had about as much experience in videography as I did in crochet. Absolutely nothing. I was starting from the beginning. So I wanted something that was going to be really simple to use as well. I won't go into detail on the technical abilities of the camera because there's been loads of reviews that have done that. Basic highlights. It's got a 24 megapixel camera. It can record in 4K, 60p in 10-bit color. Uh, and it's got all the features you need to do really good looking video and photography as well. It's got a contrast detect autofocus system. It's not phase detect. And one thing that I specifically want to mention is the lens that it comes with as a standard kit lens. Now, this is an unusual one because it comes with a 20 to 60 millimeter rather than a 24 to 70. And that's a point that I really want to hone in on at the end of this video. I want to talk about that lens because if you're perhaps thinking about getting this camera for YouTube, then that's a really important consideration. And, and I'll explain why at the end. Uh, and let's be honest, a lot of people who watch this video are going to be thinking about using it for YouTube. So let's start with the pros, first of all. Now, the first pro that I want to mention, especially as a photographer, is that the image quality is absolutely spot on. I've used this camera for a variety of different types of photography, landscape photography, street photography, portrait, night photography, commercial, you name it. I've used this camera for that photography. And because it's a full frame camera with a really advanced sensor, it performs really well under a variety of circumstances. Even in low light, you can get really, really good photos with it. It's fast, it's sharp, it's got really good colors, especially when you shoot raw. You can really adapt those files and make them work really well. And one of the things that I think a lot of people overlook is the ergonomics of a camera. And I absolutely love the ergonomics of this. It feels really good. I've got absolutely massive shovel hands. So when it comes to being able to hold a camera, that's a very important factor to me. There are so many cameras that I have rejected simply because they are not easy to use with either small hands or big hands. The S5 though, despite being a relatively small and compact full frame camera, is really easy to use. The way it fits in your hand, the grip, where the buttons are positioned, it's all really nice. And when it comes specifically to photography, I found that the autofocus is acceptable. I have used faster cameras when it comes to the autofocus, but never once has it let me down when I really needed it in photography. The autofocus picks up on somebody's eye and can generally lock onto them as long as they're not moving around too quickly. When it comes to video though, that's something we'll come on to in a minute. The video quality of the camera was actually the main reason I bought this camera because that was gonna be its main use for me. Although I do use it as a photography camera, mainly I use it for filming my YouTube videos and for my business. Now I started off this channel using a phone. So stepping up to this was a massive upgrade to me. And it was a big difference, a really steep learning curve because although I've done photography for a long time, videography was relatively new to me. So I really wanted something that was gonna work well and that was gonna be easy to use straight off the bat. And I'm really glad I went for this camera of my phone because it absolutely blew me away the difference that it makes. I'm talking like so easy to expose the footage and get the colors right. And to someone who is a relative novice to videography, I feel like moving to this camera has completely spoiled me. It's gonna be difficult to find something that will be better than this. The actual footage that you can catch is oversampled 4K, 30p or 60p. So you can get really good quality footage like that. It's got 10 bit color, as I said at the beginning, which means that you can pick up a lot of detail. Uh, like it would look good even on a big screen, that sort of detail. And it's got varying shoot modes. 
Specifically, what people like a lot about this is that you can shoot in something called V-Log, which is a very flat profile color. It starts off uh, not much saturation, uh, not a lot of contrast, but that means that the sensor picks up a lot of detail, which means that when you come to color that footage afterwards, you can really pick up the highlights and the shadows, get a really good depth of color. You can adjust the colors as well if you want to do that. And that means that you can get very, very good image quality out of it. And when I picked up this camera, I had zero experience in color grading. It's something I've had to teach myself over the past year or so. Uh, but I found that having footage that's really easy to work with has made a massive difference. It's been so nice to just learn straight away with this camera. Uh, as a bit of a side note, if you want to use the more advanced modes on this camera, the 10-bit footage, for example, you will need quite a beefy computer, something that can work with the footage, and you'll also probably need paid for software as well. For example, I use DaVinci Resolve Studio, so it's just a one-off payment, but because of that, I can work with 10-bit footage and it works really well. It's so easy to color grade it. A couple more positives. It's got a dual SD card slot, uh, which is really handy for backing up. I film on both simultaneously so that if one of them gets corrupted, that footage isn't lost. And one of the main pros about it is that the camera is dust proof and splash proof. It's got really good weather sealing, which Mr. Clumsy here really needs. And because I do a lot of my filming in Wales, we get a lot of rain here. So that was like an absolute must that the camera I bought needed to have good weather sealing. And I've used it in rain and never had a single issue with it. And just the feel of the camera, it feels really solid and like you can trust it, even if you were to drop it, which for me is probably quite an important thing to have in my back pocket. But of course, having an affordable camera means that not everything is a pro. There are a couple of cons that we need to talk about. By the way, if you love all things cameras, then feel free to subscribe because as one of the little guys, it's really hard to build an audience, as I'm sure you can imagine. So if you want to follow along then that'd be great and it'd be a massive support to the channel. So let's start with the big one, the autofocus system. Now, Personally, I found that it's not as bad as some people make it out to be. If you were to watch some reviewers, you would think it's an absolute no-no, a complete reason not to buy the camera. I have found the autofocus to be pretty acceptable, I would describe it as for videos. Now, there have been occasions where I have simply wanted to drop kick the camera, but that's because of my own perfectionism. Because it's based on contrast, if you blend into the background a bit too much, then it will lose you. Or if there's a fast moving subject, the autofocus does struggle with that. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. That's the truth. Now I've been shooting with this camera since January when the S5 II came out, which was part of a consideration for me, which I'll come on to in a minute. And since then, I've probably not been able to use maybe three clips because of the autofocus. Other than that, all the footage has worked really, really well. And if you're thinking about getting this camera as a professional camera, then autofocus won't be a problem anyway, because a lot of people who work professionally use manual focus anyway. It's the standard, it's what people do. But if you're filming yourself, autofocus is an important consideration. A couple of other cons, if you want to call them that, uh, to consider if you're thinking about buying this camera is that it does have a micro HDMI port for exporting out to external monitoring. So if you want a screen to be able to see yourself, Personally, that's not a problem for me because I'm out and about filming. I don't tend to have an external monitor anyway, which will probably be the case for most people. And the other thing is the electronic viewfinder. Now, some people don't like it. They don't think it's quite detailed enough. Personally, I've never really had a problem. For focus peaking, it's not ideal. It could do with being a little bit more detailed, having a higher dot count uh, so that you can see that focus peaking a bit more. Uh, but when it comes to photography, especially, uh, then the electronic viewfinder is absolutely fine. I've not had a problem with it at all. And there's one thing I want to mention at the end of this con list, and that is that you have to remember the price of this camera. To buy it secondhand now is less than a grand. And to get all those fantastic features, there's going to be compromise. Buying a camera always includes compromise on something. There is no such thing as a perfect camera. This whole YouTube channel is dedicated to the fact that there's no perfect camera. The compromise with this is that you get a lot of features for the money, but there's one or two drawbacks. Those drawbacks though, in my opinion, aren't enough to put you off the camera. If you can live with them and or work around them like I have, then you can have an absolutely fantastic camera for a really, really good price. And of something to really consider is the lens choice when it comes to this camera, which a lot of people haven't really talked about. Now, the S5 uses an L-mount system known as the L-mount Alliance. That means that it shares lenses with Leica, Olympus, Panasonic, and they've also got deals with Sigma who just make lenses. And 
that's actually a really beneficial thing because you have a wide variety of lenses at all different price points. You can go all the way from a Sigma budget lens that is designed just for anybody to be able to buy all the way up to Leica's super high quality lenses so that you can look down your nose at somebody behind that lovely Leica lettering. There's more than enough choice to satisfy most people's needs. One thing that some people aren't particularly a fan of is that there's no super long lenses. Uh, there's not many available where you can have really long focal lengths for wildlife photography, for example. I've seen that Sigma do one up to 400 millimeters. And personally, this isn't a problem for me as a landscape photographer and street photographer and for commercial photography as well. A massive choice of really good fast aperture primes available from Panasonic and Leica that you can get. And they've got a couple of unusual lenses as well. And this is where I want to talk about the 20 to 60. Now the kit lens that comes with this camera, I think is overlooked by a lot of many people about just how good it is. As far as kit lenses go, I think it's one of the best out there. Panasonic really knew their market when they made that lens. They knew that this was going to be a, an all-rounder camera that was going to be used by a variety of people. And Panasonic knew that the sort of people who were going to buy this camera would want quite a wide focal length so that they could do vlogging, for example. Now, a lot of standard kit lenses are 24 to 70. That's the standard. So by just making it a little bit wider, 20 to 60, that meant that if you've got a 20 millimeter focal length, you can do vlogging shots with it really easy. Say you want to do a walk and talk or be nice and close to the camera. However, as well, you can narrow it down plenty to have a much more natural focal length for B-roll and more cinematic shots, for example. Between 35 and 60 millimeters is perfect. There's minimal lens distortion and it looks really cinematic, the footage. Now, some people don't like the fact that it's not a particularly wide aperture. Personally, I would like it if it was a fixed aperture, at least 3.5 or 2.8. But you have to remember that if they were to do a fixed aperture and make it a wider aperture as well, then that would make the lens significantly more expensive and probably significantly heavier as well. One of the advantages of this as a kit lens is that it's relatively small, lightweight, and isn't expensive at all, especially if you buy it secondhand. There's so many on the secondhand market. If you break this lens, it really wouldn't be a problem to replace it at all. And personally, I have found that the aperture is just wide enough to get a shallow depth of field that isn't too much. It's a very natural looking depth of field when you use this lens for cinematic sequences. Uh, for example, I film a lot of my B-roll at 35 millimeters. I just, I love that focal length. It feels very natural to me and uh, it doesn't feel too tight in on a scene as well. I will quite often use 50 millimeters as well, uh, but at 35 millimeters, the aperture is fixed at 4.5. And as you can see on the screen now, that still gives you plenty of background blur, that lovely bokeh without it being over the top. Now, because of YouTube and social media, people absolutely love having very, very blurry backgrounds, which is absolutely fine. I've got no problem with that. I occasionally like to do that myself as well. But if you watch actual cinematic movies, they don't use apertures that are that wide. They tend to have slightly narrower apertures that stop the background from being distracting, but still place the character in the scene. And I found that the kit lens on the S5 does work really well for that. It can make some very, very nice looking footage. For photography, I'm not so sure. I'm not a big fan of the kit lens for photography. It works fine, but I do like to have a wider aperture for photography, mainly so that I can keep it sharper. It is a little bit soft at the edges when you take a picture with, especially when you've got it at minimal focal length of 20 millimeters you do start to lose a bit of detail on the edges of the frame. Not so much that it would completely ruin your photo, uh, but enough that it, you notice it if you really look for it. If you are gonna use this camera for photography, I would recommend getting a more expensive lens. It really will improve the image quality significantly. Uh, but for YouTube videos, it's absolutely sharp enough. And in fact, I really like it. It's become my favorite videography lens even over the uh, 50 mil f1.8. Now, a lot of people love using these for the videography. It looks really good and I love using it. I've used it often, but um, because of the versatility of the kit lens and just how good it looks, how lightweight it is and how easy it is to use, it is one of the main reasons that I would recommend getting an S5. I actually hope that other manufacturers consider doing this sort of focal length on their kit lenses because uh, I think it could become very, very popular. But if Lumix did consider doing a wider aperture 20 to 60, then uh, I might consider it. 
If you're watching this, Lumix, get on it. I'm sure you would sell an absolute ton. So overall, I think the S5 is an absolute bargain now, especially since the release of the S5 II. The reality is that since that was released, a lot of people have started upgrading to the S5 II. Naturally, it does improve on this camera in every single way. But what that means is that there is an absolute flood of these cameras now available on the market secondhand. They're very, very cheap to pick up. And just because it's three and a half years old now doesn't mean that it's a bad camera. In fact, it's just as good as it was when it was released. And you still get a lot of camera. In fact, even more camera for the money now. If you're somebody that's looking to move into full frame and have a good hybrid camera, I really struggle to think of anything that is as good value for this. I really wanted something that could take good photos and good video. And I really do think that for the money, the S5 is unbeatable. If you want to see what this camera can do both footage wise and picture wise, then in this video here, I talk about composition mistakes, which can be applied both to photography and videography. And I filmed the whole thing on this camera and even used it for a couple of the pictures. I'll see you next time.